with the other micro because I have a cabled micro. So I'm, I was, uh, I've been asked to hold a pre uh, presentation regarding atmospheric extreme events. I baptized it like that in order to be able to give you a rough outline of all atmospheric events related to our general issue climate. So I'm from the Goethe Institute for atmosphere and environment. I'd like to give an outline of three aspects. First of all, the socio-economic aspect, which means uh, the interface with the general public, the climate interface uh, with the general public. Secondly, the synoptic meteorological aspect regarding weather situations, weather constellations leading to extreme events. And since I'm rather intensely involved in statistics, the third aspect will be the statistical climatological aspect, which will be the largest part of my presentation. But I will not go into detail as to climate change in general. This, you will hear that from other speakers. Silke Trömel, meanwhile in Bonn, uh, co-worked here on as to the methodology used for the extreme value statistics for Germany. Unfortunately, it will not be continu continued, although being very useful and meaningful. Uh, and then uh, the results, curves, maps, in terms of temperature, precipitation, that's what I'm going to show you. As to the issue of wind in general, very in brief, very briefly, I will go into um, whirlwind structures of the various intensities, just and then in the end, uh, several conclusions and an outlook. Recent floods in Germany is the first topic. We actually know that in Germany, with intervals of several years in between, we have known various extreme flood events. You see that uh, this, this uh, picture shows the Rhine region in January 1995, where during two winters, in uh, two consecutive winters, we had Mosul and Rhine floods, then uh, 97 in the Oder region, 99 in the Danube region. And you certainly uh, you are likely to remember the big flood in the Elbe region. I already showed a picture of the city of Dresden where in August 2002 the whole city was flooded. In then followed by the high temperature heat wave summer, but it will follow later in terms of temperature because here we speak about floods. In 2005 we had floods in the North Alps and in general, and when speaking about uh, Northern Alps, this is north to Garmisch, Eppenlohe. This is not a river, this is a road. This is the riverbed. Almost uh, cannot be told from the remaining flood area and there you can see how large the flooded area was in the town area. And then in the south and east German regions of 2013, we had rather large scale um, floods. For example, in Passau, it was a 400 year flood. That means not seen uh, for 400 years here in Deppendorf, the Danube, the Danube, and this is a motor car, uh, motorway, a highway uh, during floods and not trafficable. Just uh, uh, to start off, and what is the socio-economic aspect of extreme events? We actually look into detail, into uh, damage in detail. And the advantage of this aspect is that we look into the economic consequences, also in terms of insured damage, insured loss. And the data is given by the insurers and especially the reinsurers, and also the number of casualties of death and injured. 
advantages that we have generally size, but the disadvantage is that the framework conditions are not included. That means um, the population density, density of buildings and settlements, and the concentration of high value assets. So all that, of course, are the framework conditions, the environmental conditions. We can generally say that uh, floods, the flood consequences tend to be more and more severe, especially because of a higher concentration of high-value assets. So, any, how we should look into that in detail. This is statistic, statistical uh, outline for the decade 1991-2000. It's not so recent, it's a bit dated, but it's still meaningful. First of all, I should like to say that, that the blue color shows earthquakes and volcano eruptions which are not related to climates, but all red entries refer to atmospheric or meteorological events behind. And for the number of deaths of casualties, as you can see, almost 90% are related to atmospheric conditions like windstorms, floods, droughts, etc. But in terms of damage, earthquakes are actually the peak in terms of uh, value. 35% for example for earthquakes, so that the extreme events account for about 70% in damage as regards this statistic. Every year the, the Munich reinsurance company gives data, provides data like this, shows number of casualties, uh, damage and the shares in damage and casualties broken down by disasters. This is a selection of uh, large size disasters. The Munich reinsurer outlined 50 events per year. They also have Millennium um, report starting in 2000. And I just picked out several events in order just to give you, to give us a, a rough idea as to casualties, the general economic damage and the insured damage. In 2003, in red, we had a heat wave, the very hot summer, in, uh, with a number of casualties of deaths. And you can, you can see there's a rising trend, and we expect heat summers like this, hot summers like this. France was hit very uh, strongly. We think that 70,000 deaths were, uh, occurred during the summer period, June to August 2003. In Russia in 2010, you can, you can see a lot of uh, people were killed during that hot period due to the high temperatures, 56,000, just to show you two um, specific items. As to damage, we see that in the Katrina hurricane in the US is actually the, the first or the highest value damage event. 125,000 or in million, in, uh, all this is in million US dollars, so they actually, uh, so Katrina had a, a cost, the highest damage, but I will not read the whole table, you see that, and in the proceed conference proceedings you also have this information. As to the number of events, now it's, it starts to be interesting for us as climatologists. Is there an increasing trend, is there a rise in frequencies? Then let's have a look at the period 1980 to 2015, there we see uh, 
rather a clear, statistically significant trend. In red, geophysical events like earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activities, there's no rising tendency, but the meteorological events in green uh, actually show an increase, referring to tropical storms, non-tropical storms, convective storms, local wind storms. Blue is hydrologic, hydro hydrological events like floods and climatological events in orange uh, refer to droughts, wildfires, extreme temperatures. Climatological, I don't know whether it's uh, called, you know, whether it's a good name for it, but this means heat waves, peak hot summers, Always, always related to high pressure conditions. That means heat, high temperatures and droughts accompany one another. So this is a trend. When looking into the damage, then, as already said, it's rather tricky to value them, to evaluate them. There we do not see this trend, although trend lines have been inserted, but you can see it's more or less a fluctuating uh, tr trend. At least you could say that peaks show a rising trend. This was the earthquake of Kobe, for example, this peak. This peak was the Katrina, Katrina hurricane and in 2011. That's a Japanese tsunami. It's a worldwide uh, natural disasters. Katrina, 125,000. Uh, billions of U.S. dollars and 210 then for the tsunami. So this is actually an increasing trend in public economic damage. And as to insured damage, you see the lower, the darker bars. So in, U in the USA, United States, we have more insurance and other countries less. So it's not so meaningful for, for, for us at the moment. So, so here you see the general economic damage, total ec economic damage, and the reinsured the lower bars, uh, the insured damage the lower bars. And here's a comparison between decades as to damage with a rising trend alleged by the reinsurers. So these are the decades between 1950 and 2009, and there you see it's quite an increase. But so far for the socioeconomic aspect, let's come to the synoptic meteorological aspect very briefly. What does that mean? It is about meteorological case studies as to weather conditions, particular weather conditions. I show you two examples. We have the Elbe flood, the big Elbe flood in August 2002. We, it is called VB, weather condition. Mr. Van, Van Beber baptized that. He spoke about tracks, weather tracks, but this uh, general classification was then dropped. There are no preferential weather tracks, but this weather track 5, 5A or 5B, so 5A is north-northwest impact from France round the Alps, southwards the Alps, and then it is called 5B. That means it's a, it goes round the Alps in the south and then tracks forward along the Elbe River or the Oder River or even further east with a with sequences of cyclones and uh, slowly moving cyclones with a lot of precipitation and with the consequences of heavy rainfall and floods as in August 2002. And in the second event was the then following summer in 2003, which is called an Omega uh, condition, where you have a flow system which is similar to an Omega, so low, high, low, and, and when Rossby waves are seen, it 
means certain intervals. Then we have a kind of stationary formation, and this weather formation causes a rather stagnant high pressure condition. In June it started, July was lessened, in August it reappeared in a stronger and more intense way, which meant that in the first half of August we had these those very high temperatures causing such a lot of death. So the advantage of this aspect is that you can make uh, case studies of detailed weather formations and weather situations. So you just look into one case, then into the next, and in contrast with the socio-economic uh, aspect and observation, you cannot see any trends here. But it's not just about trends, we also want to have probabilities, and that is why we have the third aspect, which is important to me, the climatological statistical aspect, that means looking into time series. We have already seen time series today. So the longer the better, at least 30 years, this is the general international recommendation, but most clim climatologists say uh, should be more than 100 years. The more information we have, the better our conclusions will be, and high quality data should, they, it should be. The advantage is we have a long term trend or we have a long-term time series and can make conclusions for the future trend. We need a wealth of data, this is a problem. And an even more problem is the definition of what is extreme. Once we have a very uh, strict and outlined definition, uh, will it be able to have enough data? In, do we have enough extreme events? And the strategy should be uh, not only extreme values should be analyzed, but all data. One strategy is so is to say to look not only into the extreme values, and I will show, illustrate it at an example, but all of the data and to look into the probability densities and we go from the empiric, empirical data to the probability density. Maybe it's hard or it's rather tricky for those not, de not looking deep into statistics, but I try to explain that. And in the end, we can actually estimate probabilities of exceeding or not exceeding certain thresholds or of exceeding or falling below maxima and minima. PDF, probability density function, is the keyword. What's the general approach? I'd like to start off with a brief example. You have seen that already. These are the averaged, the globally averaged near ground temperatures in combination with the sea surface temperature. This is an English source climatic research unit, CRU at the University of Norwich. In 1850, this uh, time series started, and this is the oldest one. So the uh, last year, 2015, could actually be called an extreme. You see there is a kind of leap in the curve and a reanalysis te techniques will in the end find to have an extreme year. This is very interesting to see the structures, the physical uh, structures in order to explain anomalies and also in order to differentiate between natural causes and anthropogenic causes, but I will not go into detail in this specific aspect. And worldwide temperatures are not normally used for extreme events, but we should stick to smaller regions. The summer temperatures in Germany are Close to the ground, ground near, near ground temperatures are in interesting data, even older than the DWD, the German Weather Service data. 
I grouped them according to the grid data delivered by the weather service. Your grub, a colleague, meanwhile uh, working with the DWD, started the analysis and preparation of the older data according to the grids. So let's look into this. We have a non-linear trend, a polynomial trend, first going down, then rising again. Then you have certain decade-based fluctuations. We have here smooth flattening, a 30-year flattening of the curve. And then we have the outliers, the peaks, summer peaks in 2003 we see the highest peak. Since 17, uh, this time series starts in 1760, we see other summers giving certain peaks uh, with a big gap between 1859 and 1947, but also before 1859 we had summers that were so hot as the 2003 summer, for example, not just a high summer temperature in Germany was found, but also instantaneous values showed records, 40.3 degrees Celsius on the 5th of July, on the 7th of August in 2015 in Kitzingen, Maine, in Bavaria. Also, the previous record dates from 2003, was just one-tenth of a degree uh, lower. But that heat summer actually was a new record. So now the question is, what's the definition of extreme? So here you can see again the summer temperatures of Germany. We can look at the mean value, but if there is a trend, and if it's significant, so I draw a line for the trend. And so usually, if it uh, deviates uh, in the standard deviation from this trend, so the doubled standard deviation the two sigma limit, 97% probability, and so you can see 1947 and 2003 stick out of this. So these were heat summers, and towards the bottom we have nothing. So there are almost no data left, and that's why it doesn't make much sense. But there are also specialists who use only the extreme values, but you get shipwrecked very quickly because there's not enough data for this. So this is one thing. And the other thing, and I think we used this term already, these are the so-called percentiles. So we um, put the time series into a probability density a function. And I already started with this and using this strategy. It's one of many strategies that can be used. And I want to show you the data, the yearly data now of uh, the German temperatures. So this is a time series similar to what we've seen before, but these are annual values. And I show only this as an example. So we can have uh, frequency distribution, so different classes, and you count the number of frequencies. And with temperature, you are mostly lucky, and you get the standard uh, distribution. So the highest frequency is in the middle, and then towards the side, is the, it decreases. So you can adjust a theoretical distribution. There are many. Uh, theoretical distribution, the standard distribution is uh, most well known. So you can test this statistically. You should use different test methods to make sure if this adjustment is correct. So this is a rule. And usually what you can see with your eye after testing, uh, it proves it. So of course, you should do the test methods and use the test methods, but mostly it's really like this. So we adjusted it, and now uh, the definition of threshold values. And I will show you also a different example for this.
And when we talk about percentiles, we go into the border areas, 10% the lower values. If this is a probability density function, it's an integral. And so we can use uh, the lower 10% and the upper 10%. So these are the percentiles, the lower percentile and the upper percentile. And uh, there are the extreme values, so you can use 5% or 10% percentile. And now the question is, if this uh, distribution changes systematically, and then also the occurrence of probability uh, changes. So I will show you two examples. One example that was in one of the uh, IPPC, IPCC reports. So this is the IPCC report of 2001, and the chart I took from my colleague Hupfer. So you see a scheme how this distribution can change. When you have the standard distribution, it can move when it gets warmer and when the variability stays the same. That's very often in temperature, and so you can see the percentile, you can see cold and warm and hot and very hot, and so when this distribution moves from there to there, this area gets smaller and this uh, area gets bigger. So the exceeding of high temperatures. And since this is a probability density function, so the probability that uh, lower temperatures occur uh, decreases and the probability that higher temperatures occur uh, this increases. And so we can also get a new values, record values like 40.3. Uh, degrees, what I showed you before. So this can develop even worse if you think such uh, high temperatures are bad. Uh, the same also in uh, tropical regions. There can also be heat waves and there are also more uh, casualties, uh, more victims. So also when it gets too hot in the tropical areas, you can also have difficulties. There are more possibilities. It can just get wider. The variability increases. This happens very seldom, but the combination of both can occur. So the distribution moves towards higher values, and at the same time it gets wider. So this is based on temperatures, uh, but um, no, usually it's uh, mostly for precipitation, not so much for temperature. And now an example of the uh, mean temperature of August in Frankfurt Main in between 1901 and 2006, and maybe some people get confused here. In this analysis, there are all uh, data in there, not only 1901. If you look at the time series and there is a trend, you can use a trend value from the beginning and we use this as a mean value, we put it in the center and when the variability stays the same, then we can shift this distribution. And so this happened here and it was calculated until 2006 and you can see the probability, so this is 17 degrees as a threshold, so the probability that such values occur decreased from 20.1.9% to 0.3% and the probability uh, that the values increase 
uh, increased to 16%. So these are results that are very significant and very clear and clearer than if you would look at the time series themselves. So this is like a film. So we did these calculations for every year, uh, the distribution parameters, the significant variables for this probability density function. So when it's the standard distribution, then it's the mean value, and you can also have the variation parameters. You can have different uh, parameters. So these are the parameters that you can use, and we calculated this for every year, the values of these parameters, and to find the distribution like this, and then it's really shifting like this. I show you now um, the falling lower of the 5% percentile. So this is the probability, this is the time, and in August, the probability uh, that it goes lower than the 5% percentile, that it will be this temperature or lower, especially in August, it decreased, in January not so much. So this is the example for Frankfurt Main. So with precipitation, we used about 200 stations. For temperatures, uh, we used 20 stations. And in every station, it's a little bit different. And in every month, it's a little bit different. So you cannot have a global uh, statement there. So the probability that the values fall below the percentile uh, decreased and also here, August is the significant month where you can see that the probability increases to exceed the percentile. So you have to pay attention to this and be careful that you don't interpret it in a wrong way. So it's not like this, that the extreme uh, events occur at a certain time period, but it's a statistical mean value. So this is a 10-year event. And when we go down, it's a 200-year event. So what we had in cold August month, what we had in 1901, every 10 years, now it would be every 200 years. And the same uh, with the heat, uh, very hot August month. So in the past it was every 100 years, and now it's 7.7 years. So you can play around with this a lot, but I don't have so much time for it. And now the whole thing according to precipitation. So when you use precipitation, you cannot use the standard di uh, distribution, but a Gumbel distribution. So this is Eppen Road. It's a small station near Koblenz in the south of Germany. And you can see that this distribution not only shifted, but it also got wider. So these are winter precipitation. So there is a probability that you have only a few uh, precipitation. And you can now have also the probability that there is a lot of precipitation. And of course, on the right hand side, there is a bigger effect than on the left hand side. And we can also calculate these functions exceeding of the 97% percentile and the falling below a certain percentile. So it increases, so that means the distribution got wider. So you see also these turning points. It gets more complicated the closer you look. And now some maps, uh, visualization in the map in January, uh, falling below uh, the 5% percentile, so a trend to dry month. 
so where you have the red uh, dots and exceeding of the uh, 95 percentile where you see red dots and when you see red dots on the left and right hand side, you see that the distribution got wider. So this was for January and now August, you see a lot of blue, so it gets more narrower. So in August, especially in the eastern part of Germany, uh, there is not so much tendency for heavy rain, but not everywhere in Bavaria and alongside the River Rhine. There are no long-term trends, so uh, the global precipitation decreases, but uh, you can have more probability of heavy rainfall. And at the very end, some uh, statements about the wind. So this is some basic information, cyclone uh, wind uh, systems, so uh, dust devils and some characteristic uh, values for this. Uh, the dust devil is not so much uh, important, but then there is tornado and uh, the hurricane. So this is just as an example. Of course, we can have a look at many details. So this is the number of tropical cyclones in the northern Atlantic. So this is the blue ones, and the red ones are uh, the number of hurricanes. And most of the specialists uh, say that there is no trend to be seen. I can see some trend here, but it's not uh, statistically significant. So you can see a trend, but it's statistically not, not uh, significant in the North Atlantic, but in the Pacific it's different. And there was some research done, uh, the summer values of the ocean uh, surface uh, temperature, so that's the Atlantic Ocean, you see a rise in the temperature of the surface, and uh, this is related to the probability of occurrence of tropical uh, cyclones, but the weaker uh, cyclones, so that's uh, category one, so there is a certain, Safia Simpson, there is a certain uh, definition, a certain scale for it. I won't talk about the details now, but what I mean is that uh, the weaker uh, categories decrease and the stronger categories increase, so heavier uh, tropical cyclones uh, increase. And about the tornado statistics in the United States, there are more than 1,000 per year, so you can also read it in the newspaper. So the United States are very much affected by tornadoes. In Germany, it's 10 to 20 per year. And Mr. Dotzek, who passed away very early, he was the specialist on tornadoes in Germany. So meanwhile, the tornado monitoring is done by the German Weather Service. So there is also a scale for the damages of the tornadoes. You see Quirla in Thuringia. So when a tornado comes into a village of a class three, and also here uh, the trees are just cut in a certain height. So these tornadoes are on a small scale, spatially. So there are some arguments that uh, they get more frequent, but this is not proved yet. And now some conclusions. The global and the regional climate change is connected to a trend to an extreme climate. So when you look at 
uh, the numbers of uh, the reinsurers. Uh, there are more damages. In Germany, it's especially significant that we have more extreme events uh, regarding the temperature and trend to hotter summers. And when you look at precipitation, especially in winter time, what we found only in winter there are some extreme uh, behavior. So the tendency to heavy uh, precipitation in summer, um, rather uh, droughts, especially in the eastern part of Germany, but in the southern part of Germany, there is also a trend to heavy rainfall in summertime. Uh, storms and tornadoes, wind is always difficult in all these uh, research done. The only thing that we could find out that the tropical uh, cyclones in the northern Atlantic, uh, the weaker decrease and the uh, stronger increase. Thank you for your interest and your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Schönwiese, for the nice presentation about uh, extremes. Are there any questions? So tornadoes uh, don't increase on a global scale and on a German scale. Uh, we cannot prove it. It could be that it increases, but it cannot be proven. Of course, you need uh, long statistics over decades or uh, 100 years for the tropical cyclones. Uh, it exists because this is on a larger scale, but uh, the question is also the reliability of this data. But in uh, Germany, it's very small scale in small areas. So there are tornadoes that don't reach uh, the ground surface uh, sometimes. So nobody will detect them. That's a matter of a few minutes, and this is not registered. Uh, it's only registered uh, when this uh, tornado reaches uh, the ground surface and uh, is responsible for damages. So Dotsek uh, proved this very nicely uh, to find out a systematic uh, for the occurrence of the different classes, but uh, trends could not be detected. But it doesn't mean that uh, they don't increase. And addition about this question of the tornadoes, there is a trend, and this is the number of uh, mobile phones with photo function, and that's why we cannot uh, give a tendency for this, because also uh, smaller events, photos were taken of this. So this this uh, trend already started in the United States five years ago, and so the base for scientific research is uh, not possible on this basis, so maybe we have to wait for 30 years. So that's also what Dotsik said. There is data that uh, show, or it, it looks like, that uh, they are more frequent, but it's just uh, they are more frequently observed. And of course, with the smartphones, you can take pictures, and but it doesn't mean that it really uh, is more frequent now. One more question. So when you use Doppler radar, can you not detect uh, the tornadoes over the whole area? When you use a Doppler radar uh, device, is it possible to detect them now over the whole area of Germany? So we have to ask the specialists of the German Weather Service. I don't know so much about the measuring systems. I know that high wind speeds can be detected <laughs> uh, by the Doppler radar because uh, these measuring devices don't fly away. 
So if you have a tornado, uh, class F5, it's 400 kilometers per hour, so no measuring device can stand this. So there is some estimation, and this is based on Doppler radar. In the United States, it's already the state of uh, technology, but in Germany, uh, they are much smaller on a smaller scale, and we cannot detect them. So they have to have a certain dimension that we can actually detect them. So uh, you cannot compare this. In the United States, a tornado is something different than in Germany.